Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba boo. Hey everybody, it's your favorite assholes on the internet. <laughs> Welcome back to Rob Michael, featuring Robin, Erica, Molly, and Michael. Today we're talking about music in 1989. Each time you bring up one of the albums that we already talked about, I'm like, oh yeah, I love this one. Like, I forget that we already <laughs> talked about it. It's like, the rest is just like an also rants. This is a really cool album. It started with this abandoned cistern that these musicians just went down there to play and hang out. And they're like, oh, this sounds so cool. It would be cool if we could record this. They raised some money to record it. And then this album came out of it. But then their working together and working with acoustics so much was so fruitful for them that they then started the Deep Listening Institute, which then got absorbed into some university. It's still like a leading school group on um, any kind of acoustics and anything like that. I listened to this one once or twice, and it's not really suitable for meditation as you think it might be. Um, it's because it, there is sort of too much going on for that. But um, it is, uh, it's kind of a tough listen because it's, it's challenging music. It really does force you to really focus on what's going on. So deep listening makes sense. It's not a very good album. Was that her first album? Yeah. I didn't know about her until like 1996 when everybody else knew about her. Yeah. When the Adopt a Dog commercials started coming out and making us cry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Her third album is like one of my all time favorites. That's all, all that stuff is on her fourth album. Mm -hmm. Little known secret Michael Oberhauser is a Sarah McLaughlin super fan. This is the album that has You Got It on it. Wait! Oh, wow, I thought that was That's a much older 1989? song. That's 1989. Right? That's my reaction. Mm -hmm. I always thought those songs were from like the 60s. The. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the first songs I remember hearing on the radio. I was seven years old, so it was it was pretty late in my childhood, but But I felt like I heard those songs on like the oldies station. They might have also been like older. a cover of an older song. Um uh, maybe, or maybe he just recorded it twice. Well, cause he also did Pretty Woman, right? And wasn't that an older song? Like, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm having a I was this years old when I learned moment. <laughs> I didn't think he was at the height of his career in the late 80s, I guess is what I'm saying. I thought he was at the height of his career in like the 60s. He died of a heart attack in December 1988. Well, I don't really have a ton to say about Roy Oberson, but I really do like the timpani and you got it. Bom, bom. <laughs> I'm just shocked and appalled at the date of this appalled? track. I am appalled. <laughs> I am fully appalled. I'm sure middle-aged drag kings in the 80s were very grateful that he was still relevant. Okay. Well, and I think it actually says something about how the music of the early rock and roll period is so um, enticing to artists through the ages because I think we have seen artists mimicking that sound throughout. Which is the album that has Drives Me Crazy on it. <gasps> that <laughs> song! I hate it. <laughs> it's, I, I it don't so think I like it, but I do think that I remember hearing it very often. It was very of a moment, I yeah. think. <laughs> it's the album that has Closer to Fine on it. Yes. Okay, I have things to say about this song. This is a song that I have a very specific association with, which is, it's Saturday, maybe a Sunday in late spring. It's a sunny, beautiful day. It's not too hot. And all the windows are open in the house. And my parents are outside doing yard work and they're blasting <laughs> the Indigo Girls closer to fine so that they can hear it outside in the yard while they do yard work. I feel like it's just fine as a song. I'm just kidding! It's just a pun because the word fine is in the title. I love that song. <laughs> Indigo Girls and Grey. <laughs> that song is so good. I'm sorry I heard you. I actually <laughs> like re fell in love with that song like a couple years ago. You hear a song as a child and you're like, this is a song that has a chorus that I know all the words to. And then you hear it as an adult and you're like, oh, these are lyrics, man. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're, she had something to say. All my favorite artists were like that re falling in love with the truest and best artists of our generation. 
So De La Soul came out with Three Feet High and Rising this year, which I really don't know much about at all, but it is apparently like one of the great hip hop albums of all time. In fact, it's some like it's often just called one of the great albums of all time. Yeah. I think a lot of people's image of hip hop is very colored by modern hip hop, but old school hip hop is totally different. Some of the influences are still there, but it's completely different because like it was before a lot of white producers kind of took over the, that whole scene. Well, it's also before a lot of the copyright laws went into effect so yeah they were at this time really the, the art of sampling was so deep mm -hmm. and they were taking this note from this song and these four notes from this song and, and making something really beautiful out of mm -hmm. uh, out of out of all of those things and then the copyright laws change and they can't afford to do that anymore because you have to buy the license for every yeah. song that you take a moment from. There's a great documentary series on Netflix about the history of hip hop and it talks about how these guys used to go into this sort of warehouse used record sale kind of thing at, like every weekend that like it was happening and they were digging through these albums to try to find like the like most unusual thing that they could make a beat from, right? And like, like I want to make a beat from something that nobody would expect that you could make a beat from. And like, they were just trying to find the most obscure shit <laughs> in order to do that. I loved Donna Summer, and I listened through her entire catalog not too long ago. This is not one that stuck out to me, though. Uh, what does stick out to me, though, is the album cover. What's that is going a whole on? <laughs> thing. Is she just a ghost? album is so good. This album was definitely like in my household. Like it was in the multi-disc uh, CD changer thing mm -hmm. that and then yeah. you know go to the next one at a party or whatever. Yeah. We, She's such a such a great musician. The honesty in her voice and her incredible guitar playing which has Free Fallen and I Won't Back Down on it. Oh, I Won't oh, Back Down back is such down. a good song. Really? And yes, know. it is such a good song. And you know what? It gets overshadowed by Free Fallen because any idiot with two fingers can play it on the guitar <laughs> yeah. and sound cool. I Won't Back Down has great backup vocals. And it's just, it's got a great chorus. Yeah, the, the chorus is so good in that song. It's so fun to sing along with. Which has right here waiting. To me, you said earlier your mom likes mom music. To me, that's mom music. That yeah, is same. mom music. That's mom and music. I, I don't consider Bonnie Raitt mom music. Uh, Richard Mark doesn't he have a bunch of other songs that are like super simple, but yeah. like sung very passionately and yes, earnestly. Like that's He's very thing. much in his oeuvre. <laughs> yeah. Which has I drove all night on it. <laughs> I love that song and ironically and you need to look up videos of her performing it live because she gets down like even at her age like if you look up Cindy Lauper at her age she still does all the same shit mm -hmm. yeah. Cindy like, Lauper doesn't do fun. anything a little bit I don't think that's I don't think that's the Cindy Lauper way which is the album that has Eat for Two and Trouble Me on it. The only album of 10,000 Maniacs that I know is the MTV Unplugged, and those two are on the MTV Unplugged. I will say this is one of the better album names that I know of from the 1980s. It's just, it's just Blind Man Zoo. That's just yeah. a fun name. I was talking the other day, not the other day, maybe several months ago, about how <laughs> the kids these days, the youths, like the Gen Z people, they don't know 10,000 Maniacs and they don't know Natalie Merchant and it's like they have faded into history and like the youths don't know her and um, I just think that's wrong. I mean people five years younger than us don't know they exist. Forget about the 20 somethings. Yeah. Well yeah it's just it's it's bizarre to me that like because there's a lot of music that rightly so has preserved itself in popularity throughout the years and the 10,000 Maniacs is not one of them and I just don't understand why. It's a real shame. Well, and the voice of Natalie okay. Merchant is just... Yeah, her voice is so good. Are you worried about time? No, I'm one of the people you're talking about. Nobody has a voice like Natalie Merchant. It's no. just so no. unique. Yeah. Which has, if I could turn back time on it, on it. I love her so much, and I don't know why. <laughs> like, the camp value. <laughs> sort of, but also, you know, I think there's been a lot said about gay icons, so I'm gonna say it again. Um, 
Gay icons typically are beloved when they are like especially unique or their style is sort of inimitable. Like you can apply the same statement to Judy Garland, for example. Nobody sounds like Judy Garland, even if they sing the same shit. Even like Britney Spears, who like I wouldn't say that about her singing, but her performance style. And Cher is that way too. Like it's often the the singers who other people don't really love so much that the gays kind of flock to. But even if I weren't gay, I think I would still enjoy Cher. Can't That's probably talk not about true. if I could turn back time without talking about the music video and that, and that little V shaped one piece with the all over fishnet. What an icon! And that body, first of all, if I had a body like that, I would show it off. <laughs> She's singing for like a bunch of like sailors, right? Who are like screaming. Who are definitely <laughs> heterosexual. And, well, I think the implication <laughs> is that they are heterosexual and that like she's wearing this extremely sexy outfit. Instead, they are homosexual and she's wearing an incredibly campy outfit. <laughs> what a way to make a comeback though. Like, mm -hmm. oh, just yeah. like, show up like, bam, here I fucking am. And the hair. Oh uh, yeah. Which has, how am I supposed to live without it? So I get him mixed up with Richard Marx because they both do that like very simple song sung extremely earnestly. Like, their, their voices are very different. Yeah. Though. I have never understood the appeal of sorry. No, I don't get it either. I know so many middle-aged white women who are like throwing panties at Michael Oh, Bolton I think he has a certain hot dad energy. Yeah. I mean, he's not unattractive. I'm talking about his singing and his music. 1999 might have just been just a good year for the screamy, whiny tenor. Maybe. <laughs> The album sold because it's a, it's a Prince album. It's not really a soundtrack. Like these songs right. are in the movie. The soundtrack is so inextricable from the movie itself. The the, the two are, are very important to each other. You couldn't have one without the other. Yeah. That's why I like that they chose like one central artist. It, like we have the compositions of the sort of background music, but we had so many songs by Prince that were an important part of the story. And it's all so fucking campy. Yes. <laughs> very campy, but very fun and yeah. very much a part of this movie that was a big moment. Which has Love Shack and Rome Oh on it. my god. Is this the chance for me to talk about the time that my dad took me to a B-52s concert? When I was a teenager and my, I was a child of divorce and my dad lived in Atlanta and my mom lived in Virginia, I used to fly frequently to Atlanta to visit my dad and whichever girlfriend he had at the time. He picks me up at the airport and we're driving back to um, his place from the airport and he's, you know, talking, how are you been? Like da 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 da, you know, dad and daughter talk. And then he goes, Oh, by the way, before we knew like the schedule of when you would be coming down here, my girlfriend and I got tickets to see this concert and like, would you want to go or like, is that something you would want to do or, you know, would you rather just stay home and like watch TV? And I said, well, what is the concert? I'm like 16 at the time and I don't realize how cool my dad is, right? Uh, well, what is the concert? He goes, it's the B-52s. I was like, fuck yes, I want to go. <laughs> we went to the vintage store that I used to love in Atlanta and I bought, this is when I bought my iconic 1970s frilly tuxedo shirt that I was like famous for in high school. <laughs> and I was like, I'm wearing this to the B-52s concert. And like, oh man, I, I looked so cool. We went to this concert, it was an outdoor like amphitheater kind of concert. And it's basically a hometown show for the B-52. So they're like on. And it was so much fun. And then it started raining right when they played Love Shack. <laughs> and I'm like dancing in the rain to Love Shack. And it was one of the most perfect moments of my life. I do kind of feel like, I mean, Love Shack is the song that everyone knows the B-52s for. And rightfully oh, so, it's, so a, good. it's a fantastic song. Rome is a great song. Is overshadowed. It, they, um, uh, Rock Lobster, which is not on this album. No. Um, Kate and Cindy, is that the blonde's name? Yes. Mm -hmm. They sound so good on Rome. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really such a showcase for their voices. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas a lot of the other songs are sort of jams and, you know, just sort of party jams. Um, but uh, when they sing Rome, it still has that party jam vibe, but like, it's, there's no Fred, like, it's really just their vocals. So this is mom rock, but I love the end of the innocence. You that love song. mom yeah. rock. I not all mom rock. I don't love <laughs> like. Not all mom rock. <laughs> I, 
But the end of the innocence is is I'm I'm with Ramin on this one. I've I've always Thank enjoyed you. it. I always listen to it when it comes on. And and my only qualm with this with, in the late '90s when I was when I was graduating or or getting ready to graduate high school, a lot of classes wanted to make it their graduation song. I'm like, you don't know what this is about. Which has Wicked Game on it. Oh. Which makes everyone titillated. That was also in Rightfully. the multi-disc changer with the Indigo Girls and the Bonnie Raitt album. I know not everyone loves it, but I really love it. Oh, and the, the sexy music video oh with the beach. Yes. Oh my god, it is like, that was like my like sexual awakening was watching that music video. <laughs> oh, what a voice. Yeah. Which has Get On Your Feet. Yes! So ah, good. those horns! Yeah. She was just one of the first pop stars that I was like, similar to Paula Abdul, like one of my first favorite artists. <laughs> this is interesting. With the release of Cuts Both Ways, this album, uh, Estefan was marketed as a solo artist, but Miami Sound Machine continued to perform as her backing band in the studio and on tour. And mm. performed well and should have gotten credit for it. Yes. Yeah, they're mm. fantastic backing band. <laughs> which has the disco cover of Losing My Mind on it. So I think that this version of Losing My Mind was actually the first I ever listened to before the original from the musical, um, because I was like a, a high school little gay teen and I was looking up songs that I want, might want to sing and there was some like old school like GeoCity style website, like old school <laughs> website that had all these links to show tune recordings and for some reason, this was the version of Losing My Mind that they linked to. <laughs> which has Janie's Got a Gun on it. I've always hated that song. <laughs> I like kind of actually love Aerosmith, even though I know it's not like quality music all the time. I like the very earliest Aerosmith and then some of the 90s Aerosmith hits. Aerosmith managed to really have this longevity and, and popularity that really went what, 30, 40 years? Yeah. I mean, if we are talking about like uh, when they were on the Armageddon soundtrack and like all of that, that's really a very long career for somebody who was really doing crazy things with his voice that yeah. should not yeah. be able to do into your 70s. I do think Janie's Got a Gun, it's a, it's, it was an overplayed song, but I don't think it's a bad song. I think it just doesn't have a lot of hook to it. It's just that really simple repetitive melody. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could say it's all hook. To me, Aerosmith is their he best when they're like openly trashy, almost says, pornographic. Yeah, like, he says the lyric in that song that I love is living it up while I'm going down. <laughs> <laughs> Which has the best on it. I, so I don't know a whole lot of this album, but I love the song the best. I love it so much because it's just like blatant tink to turn to come back. Yeah. I mean, they're not really a comeback, because I think, um, what was it called? Um, What's Love Got To Do With It was also this decade. That was the so. comeback. Yeah. I have a problem because I associate that song with, like, I think, a Chevy truck commercial. Oh, my oh. God, yeah. Oh, Rockin' in the Free World was a huge song. Really? From Freedom? Yeah, that's oh, I, the first why did, track. Why didn't I write it down? Because I absolutely know that song. Well, and that is the song where he basically, like, pillories the Bush administration and they're in the uh, Gulf War. Another song that gets the Bruce Springsteen effect because people here keep on rocking in the free world and they're like, yeah, America. But like, it's actually a song about like American imperialism, like uh, imposing violence on the rest of the world. Which has Don't Know Much with Aaron Neville. Linda Rodstead is, is the quintessential mom rock in my view. She was legitimately super talented. Oh yeah, here's the thing. Mom rock is not not good, just like dad bods are not not sexy. Right. I agree. Yes, I agree. <laughs> it all comes down to your taste. Do not be afraid of your own taste. That's that, right. That, that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. We're all just talking about our opinions. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Yeah. What do we Cut. know? We got the quote we needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're done. Which is the, the album that has Love Will Lead You Back on it. So I irrationally love Taylor Dane. As in, I listen to her cover of Barry White's Can't Get Enough of Your Love regularly while I'm cooking. And I don't know why I like her because she does this thing with her voice that like, like that, it's a lot of tongue tension. And like, it's a, it's objectively not a pretty sound, but I love it. I know all these songs. <laughs> oh, what is this hair on this album cover though, Taylor? What's going on? Oh, that's very of the it's moment. A, it's a lot. Yeah. I'm really feeling like this is the year of like 
the mom rock ballads. <laughs> I think it was 88 that we talked about was the year of the beach rock ballads. Which has just a friend on it. Yes! You got what, what I need! need. Such an excellent song. <laughs> so good. But he was singing out of tune. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh, it's, it's so good. Also, the, the video for this song is fantastic. Oh, it's so good. It's so funny. I know that like it's fun to make fun of Billy Joel, but I think he's actually great. This album has We Didn't Start the Fire, and this album has And So It Goes. We Didn't Start the Fire is a good song. And So It Goes is one of the most beautiful songs. It is. It might be my favorite Billy Joel. It's probably mm -hmm. mine. Which has All Around the World. Is that a one-hit wonder? Yeah. 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 She also is one of those ones who was known more for her look in many ways. If you watch that video, like, it's very, like, it's almost masculine. But well, she, she does the, like, cabaret, like, curl on the yeah. forehead thing. Uh, yeah. Do I remember that that song ha had that, like, ni early 90s, like, club feel, like, that oh, everybody's yeah. talking about with the new Beyonce track? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to just some general popular songs. Soul to Souls, Song Back to Life. Oh, Excellent song. To, yeah. Another, like, 90s club so kind good. of jam. Yeah, so th that's actually a thread that I sort of wanted to follow, because it, this stuff is, like, really starting to happen. Happen. Yeah. No? I also strongly associate that song with Will Smith and yeah. the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alana Miles' Black Velvet. Oh, Another of the great drag race there? lip syncs. I was gonna ask if that ever was one because it needs yes, to be. <laughs> Juju B won that lip sync. Okay. Young MC, Bust a Move. Oh, that's one of the great hip hop songs. Band Aid 2, Do They Know It's Christmas. That was the super group with all the, like it had Michael Jackson yes. and you yeah. 2 started it. It was like, We Are the World, either before it. or after. Yeah. That was, that was you know band what? One. Oh, this is band okay. two. I actually really like that song. I Ew. really do like a Christmas song. Get out. I, it's a fun song. Come on, you stick in the muds. We also have Howard Jones' Everlasting Love, which this is a super fun song that you, we probably all forgot about. It's, uh, it's but so fun. also, fun fact, Gloria Estefan covered it later and she was pregnant at the yeah. time they filmed the video. So she just hired every drag queen in Miami who impersonated her and they do the whole That's video. That's amazing. Wait, and it and actually passes off as her? Yes. Oh, it's one of the my best. God. <laughs> Though the album that this song is on released later, um, this single released in 89, which is The Cure Love Song, which I love. It's an excellent song. song. It's so good. Got The Cure. An almost like unearthly quality to it. Like not unearthly, that's like dreamlike. That's what I mean. A Vaseline sort of on, on the lens. camera lens sort of. Also in advance of their 1990 album, Depeche Mode's Personal Jesus, which I <gasps> fucking love. Good song. Oh, so good. It's kind of the Depeche Mode song, mm. right? Like it's the sort of the one that everybody knows and it's it, that voice, man. <laughs> So good. Technotronics pump up the jam. We're starting to hear these club jams. Like Jock you jams. Were saying. Pump up the jam was on yeah. Jock jams. It was jams. on Jock jams, but I do feel like it was also in my dance classes. Well, it was kind of everywhere for like 20 years straight. Pump it up, you'll bump it. It was at every dance recital, every sporting event, every. Everything. Game time! Last time Erica and Molly tied for first place. So Ramin is first. Um, Molly has won more often than Erica, so let's go Ramin, Erica, Molly. But let's look at um, um, the Grammys from 1989. Even though I want to say Bette Midler, I'm going to go with Bonnie Raitt. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ramin's got the first five. Go against your gay instincts. <laughs> okay. Billy Joel. No, Molly. I was gonna guess Billy Joel. Roy Orbison. No, Remain. How am I supposed to live? That's it. Really? Don't you know yep. middle-aged white they ladies? They picked the worst song, <laughs> as <did>. usual. <laughs> this is group, duo yeah, or group. Duo, duo or group. Linda so, Ronstadt and Aaron Neville. That's it? Yeah. Is that the one that Millie and Vanilli won and had to give back? And this category is? Best New Artist. Best New Artist? I think it's Millie Vanilli. It is Millie Vanilli. Okay. Record of the year. Billy Joel. No. Erica. Billy Joel is getting cheated. Right? He should have won these. This is a bit Miller. It is Bit Miller. Okay. Wow. Molly, song of the year. I really want to say Billy Joel, but that has been wrong so far. That's all the more reason why I could be right here. Uh, I I do think it's Billy Joel. Was not. Fuck your shit! <laughs> For me. I'm gonna go with End of the Innocence. No, Erica. Damn. It's Don't, gotta be Bette Midler. It is. It, it's it's with yes. Come on, Bette Midler. Molly, album of the year. Okay, my heart says Bonnie Raitt, Nick of Time. My brain says Don Henley. My body's saying let's go. But I think, <laughs> I'm gonna go with Bonnie Raitt. It is, yeah. 
Okay, so that's it for the Grammys. Billboard Hot 100. We're mean it's to you first. What do you think fits in the Billboard Hot 100? Oh, fuck. Um, this is hard. I mean, I want it to be Anita Baker. I'm sorry that we didn't talk about her at all, but Anita Baker, I think, is the greatest R&B singer of this decade. So we're trying to pick the top 10 songs of the year, yeah. according to Billboard. Okay. And this is the top 30 that I've given you. I gotta go with Madonna like a prayer. No. Wow. Erica. Mm -hmm. New Kids on the Block, I'll be loving you forever. Nope. Yeah, Molly. My turn? Yes. She drives me crazy, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. What? That I song was the only song they played on the radio that year. Probably, I think it was probably later. All right, is it my turn again? Yes. Well, shit. She won so many goddamn awards, it must be Beth Midler. Win Beneath My Wings. Yes, that was number seven. Ah. Richard Marks right here waiting for you. <laughs> no, I was surprised about that one. What you got, Molly? Millie Vanilli, girl, you know it's true. That is number eight. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go with Paula Abdul straight up. That is number four. Seven points for me. <laughs> there we go. Bon Jovi, I'll be there for you. When I think of Bon Jovi popping no. songs, I think of Bon No! I just lost. Yeah, Erica's out. I think it's Every Rose Has Its Thorn. That was number three. Wow! That was higher than I thought it was. Okay, I thought that was a shot in the dark. She did me right before, so she's gonna do me right again. Paula Abdul, cold hearted. That was number six. I think it's Millie Vanilli, Blame It on the Rain. No. Aww. I don't know why I'm gravitating to this choice, but Roxette, listen to your heart. No. Damn. Phil Collins, Two Hearts. If that's wrong, I'll be heartbroken. If that's yeah, wrong, you're then you'll win. I'm gonna stick with my girl. Hold on, Abdul, forever your girl. for the guineas this time, so Madonna's like a prayer. No. Not a chance in hell. Imagine writing for Pitchfork and not acknowledging the greatness of Madonna's right. like a prayer. I think uh, the Pixies do little. That was number one. <laughs> wow! <laughs> My favorite album on the list was their favorite album. <laughs> I am trying to think of like cis head white guy demographic so I'm gonna go with Neil Young Freedom. That was number five. Okay. Respectable. Aerosmith Punch. Della Soul. That was number catch. that was tied for number three. What was the song from the Tom Petty again? Free Fallen. Okay. Definitely Tom Petty then. Like that? that? No. Really? No. Okay, so um camera change. <laughs> 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 um, let's pick up where we left off. We were on Erica, correct? Yeah. Billy Joel Stormfront. No. <laughs> Chris Isaac. Chris Isaac was not one of those. Oh, snap. What a wicked game. I'm gonna go with Beastie Boys. Yes, that is number six. Get your face, Molly. I didn't know a single track off of that album. I was this close to saying Doubter. I think it's Kate Bush. It is not. No! Oh, no, I lied, I lied, I lied. It is. Okay. It is. <laughs> the drama continues. You're welcome. Nirvana, Bleach. Oh, that's a good guess. No, though. Wow. What about Cher? You don't think white guys love Cher? Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails was number two. What? That album is really fucking good. It's I mean, really, really, it's really good. It's revolutionary. I'm going to guess this because it's the name of the magazine. The Rolling Stones, Steel Wheels. Terrible guess. The Rolling Stones, Steel Wheels was number seven. I'm sorry, what was the terrible guess, Molly? What? <laughs> Were you saying something? That was really high on the Rolling Stone list. It was not on the Pitchfork list at all. I, I, you know, Batman. Nah. <laughs> what? Ha! I'm gonna go with the Sugar Cubes. No. Okay. She's well, not... it could be Cindy Lauper, but I kind of want to throw a Hail Mary pass at Biz Margie. <laughs> is it? It is not. Molly's out. Ramin's got one more. Okay, well that's it for the games. This time, Molly was the winner of the music game. I'm great. Isn't she always? <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> that's it for this video. Uh, thanks everybody. Let us know if there's anything that we missed from Music in 89 that you wanted to talk about, or if there are any opinions that you do not share that we expressed. Smash that like button, ring that bell! <laughs> All those things. You can ring my bell. That's it. Good night, everybody. Or good day or good morning. And uh, maintain your group yourselves. I'm sorry, did you say it's true? Girl, you know oh, it's true! Let's eat our 
Oh my god, we just, we're gonna get pinged by YouTube so many times. 